You've all had a chance to see a series of installation uh, shots from the exhibition, which is on view upstairs through the end of this month. Um, for, the last few, uh, the, for the last several months, uh, the, the three of us... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's your cue. Yeah. <laughs> the three of us, uh, Thomas, Jay Lax, Chantal Lawson, and myself, um, we've been working on tonight's program, um, which is titled Studio Lab, Matters of the Mind. Studio Lab is an interactive, artist-centered program designed for ideas information. As an interactive program, it offers the opportunity to break up the traditional panel program, wherein you, the audience, is predominantly here to receive information from the presenters. Here Tonight, we ask you to actively participate based on the context the panelists construct. I am joined on stage by my colleagues. Now you come on stage. <laughs> uh, Shanta Lawson, Education Manager. Um, and Thomas J. Lax, uh, assistant curator, who is also the organizer of the exhibition, When the Stars Begin to Fall. Uh, this program was organized between us three and has offered us an opportunity to take on one of the central ideas the exhibition identifies about artists working with different cognitive and mental abilities. Each of us has approached the topic through an essential question. Um, and from a community engagement uh, perspective, I ask, how might we genuinely identify and and involve artists and audiences who are homebound. Thank you, Edmund. Um, I want to personally thank all of the arts educators, teaching artists, arts and minds co-facilitators, and members of the Studio Museum Education Department who are here tonight. Uh, for the program this evening, my essential question comes from the perspective of museum educators who discuss and interpret artworks for different audiences. Our challenge is to ask questions and challenge our audiences to think deeply about the work and create an environment where viewers can reflect and make meaning together. So my question is, as art educators, how might we navigate the significance of artist biography and artistic process? Thank you, Shanta, and thank you, Edwin. Um, can everybody hear all right in the room? Yeah, in the back as well? Super. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, I want to thank Callie Ringel and Adize Wilford, as well as Jeffrey Cohen, um, for uh, working to organize tonight's program. Um, the program will begin with three 10-minute presentations, starting with Valerie Rousseau, who is the curator for art of the self-taught and art brute at the American Folk Art Museum here in New York, followed by Tom DeMaria, who's the Director of Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland, California, and Jacoby Satterwhite, who's an artist featured in When the Stars Begin to Fall. The presentations will be followed by a 30-minute conversation moderated by Adrian Edwards, who's the Associate Curator at Performa, and then they will open up to questions from the audience and will conclude with a, light, a reception of light fare and drinks. Um, so my question for tonight is how do we have meaningful conversations working with different sets of terms from different institutional vantage points and in different cultural contexts? Um, to get a head start on the program, please join me in welcoming Valérie Rousseau. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and uh, studios and people. Everybody is so nice. Thank you for this great invitation. <clears throat> so I will start right away, since we have just a, a, a quick uh, 10 minutes. So, so I will start with a personal note. I clearly, clearly remember when I started my curatorial position at the American Folk Art Museum about one year ago. I stood up in our, in our storage facility amazed by the accumulation of treasure surrounding me. Well, my definition of what is a treasure must differ from the common taste, because most of these objects created by self that artists are both creators, folk artists, untrained, non-professional artists operating outside, of, in, outside in independently of the art mainstream narratives without knowledge of canonical artistry. Yes, all those treasures were once objects that nobody wanted. Major art institutions didn't want to save or conserve them. They have been thrown away, hidden by relatives, vandalized, in short, repressed from our culture. 
favorable circumstances need to align in order for these works to be discovered, preserved, and then collected. History shows us that this kind of rescue is the result of a highly biased inter intervention, a pilgrimage led by a favorable fa family member or passionate acquaintance. A good example, the Palazzo Encyclopedico uh, of Marino Oriti that became uh, the central uh, theme of the Venice Biennial. Before its conservation by the American Folk Art Museum, the work remained in storage for 22 years, during which time his family failed to gain the interest of well-established art museums and archite architectural organizations, all of which declined to get such a piece in their collections. The current vitality of this kind of material is less dependent on the politics of acquisition by museums than on the wills of isolated individuals. Only a small percentage of these works has survived. So I saw these objects in, uh, in AFAM's collection as survivors, and AFAM as a refuge, a sanctuary, an asylum. And the metaphor of the asylum is quite accurate somehow. There's an interesting um, parallel to draw between this collection and uh, mental hospitals. The historical sociologist of psychiatry, Andrew Skoll, wrote in his 1979 uh, book, Museums of Madness, quote, from the moment most asylums opened, they functioned as museums for the collection of the unwanted, dumping grounds for a heterogeneous mass of physical and mental wrecks. This is this idea This is this idea of art forms, one perceived as dumpings, dumping grounds of culture, <coughs> that I explored a little further in my essay for our actual exhibition, self Genius, at the museum, which not only includes um, uh, a nice piece by Judith Scott affiliated with the Creative Growth Art Center. So I found that somehow these artworks are revealing a side of our collective unconscious. They highlight subjects concerns, desires that are not typically externalized or deemed worthy of note. Though largely self-referential and fueled by first-hand experiences, they connect the seemingly unconnected in significant ways, illuminating hidden forces within the matrix of history. The genius of these creators is often, at least partially, a result of their oblique angles of vision. It lies in their inventiveness, ingenuity, and ambition, as well as in the timeless capacity of their art to shake up the dust. In an article discussing the cultural statu quo, art critic Thomas McEvely reacted to the persistent difficulty of the contemporary art world on the willingness to embrace cultural differences. Referring to the productions of Thornton Dial, Lonnie Holly and Ronald Lockett, which exhibit deeply coded narrative content, he explained that the works and practices of African Americans reflect on black American vernacular traditions that are not yet integrated into our general art understanding. They offer a re-examination of the fundamental tenets of Western democracy and race relations. The core of this idea is applicable to many of the artists we have in our collection at the American Folk Art Museum, whose <coughs> works are, are vested in mindsets in which narratives are coded and veiled. Sorts of private theaters, they seem to operate in closed circuit, displaying a vocabulary of their own. Here, another word. Melvin Which brings me to the French artist and collector Jean Dubuffet, the inventor of Art Brut, since I'm, I need to speak about definitions tonight, who questioned uh, the notion of the artist as exceptional, um, as exceptional through the figure of the common man, challenging the assumption that art is a domain reserved only for those trained in art schools. Beyond pure provocation, Dubuffet's belief stands as a criticism of the institution in all its forms and of cultural ideologies governing Western societies. 
Between 1948 and 1951, he built a collection of 1,200 works, uh, artworks made by about uh, 100 creators, self-taught artists, mediumistic artists, marginal people, originals, eccentrics, dissidents, and these are the words that he was using to describe his collection, but also people with psychiatric disorders and mental illness, individuals with tragic journeys who have been hospitalized, incarcerated, isolated. By Arbrut, du buffet meant, and I quote, works executed by people untouched by artistic culture, in which therefore mimicry, contrary to what happens in intellectuals, plays little or no part, so that their authors draw everything, subject, subjects, choices of materials employed, means of transposition, rhythms, ways of writing, from their own depths and not from cliches of classical art or art that is fashionable. Here we are witnessing an artistic operation that is completely reinvented in all its phases by its author. This collection donated to the city of Lausanne in Switzerland in 1972 uh, known under the name Collection de l'Art Brut or Museum, uh, Musée de l'Art Brut, <coughs> is still today a seminal collection of reference in our field. This museum holdings is around uh, today 60,000 words, which shows that the definition of Art Brut continued to evolve after Du Buffet. The changing nature of Art Brut was indeed at the core of this Art Brut concept. Concerning the nature of, art, uh, of the art du buffet collected at this time, I will make a quick digression and refer to a conversation between the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss and du buffet, and picked as a background example the wonderful Devil House of uh, Frank Jones that you have here, that you can see in, in Thomas' uh, brilliant exhibition. So, uh, Jones produced over 500 works um, once he was in the Texas prison system. So Claude Lévi-Strauss is among those fans of the exhibitions uh, organized by Du Buffet at the Foyer de l'Art Brut in Paris in 1948-1949. Lévi-Strauss pressed him uh, to develop his research in prisons to find drawings, sculptures, and writings by inmates graffitis on prison walls, tattoos. Well, it didn't happen. Du Buffet was reluctant to consider prisoners systematically as Arbrut artists, seeing their creation as responses to confinement. Michel Thévaux, the first director of Du Buffet's collection in Lausanne, explained that for Du Buffet, these creations seem to be circumstantial, based on the circumstances of isolation and thus responses to exclusion. Similarly, the Buffet didn't want to uh, consider the works by groups of outsiders, like those studied by the sociologist Howard Baker, like anarchist or graffiti artist. The independence of Albert creators vis-a-vis -vis the art tradition is not an act of social rebellion, <coughs> but a distance they take vis-a-vis -vis the norms and conventions in general which has more to do with a communicational, dis a dis a di a communicational dysfunction. This nuance is also one of the many distinctions between artist uh, Henri Breton and Jean Dubuffet. Their differences would eventually lead to the dissolution of the Collection de l'Art Brut, what was at the, at the time called the Compagnie de l'Art Brut, in 1951. Du Buffet insisted that Art Brut included the art by, uh, by all kinds of outsiders and not only restricted to mental, mental patients. Breton's interest for enchantment and magic clashed with Du Buffet's anti-psychiatry attitude where mental illness is seen as a deficit. Furthermore, Du Buffet was reluctant to exhibit Art Brut along professional art. He tried to maintain the distinction between professional art, which results from a complex social di dialectic, and art brut, an idiosyncratic, almost autistic voice, whose intensity emerged from a social disconnection. For him, 
they were two different distinct voices that could not be mixed without nuance. Revealing output according to professional art mechanisms would conduct um, to ban banalization, a trivial trivialization, a shift back of the object to an ordinary status. In the psychedelic uh, field in the 1920s uh, in Europe, a generation of doctors collectors shown a growing interest for the drawings of their patients, notably because of the privileged access to the unconscious those drawings could provide, but also because they saw them as artworks. Aside the seminal monography on Adolf Wolfli by the Swiss-based doctor uh, Walter Morgenthaler at La Waldeau uh, in 1921, um, another major contribution by the German doctor Hans Prinzhorn will contribute to the double status of these objects created by mental patients. Clinical documents and artworks, both status together. Prinzorn worked at the Edelberg uh, Clinic between 19, 1919 and 1921, just for three years, and put together a plan to build a pathological art museum. He solicited donations and loans of works from mental institutions in Switzerland, Germany, Italy and Austria. The study for his book, Artistry of Mentally Ill, is based on the reunion of 5,000 works created by over five, 500 patients. The book will rapidly gain the attention of the European art world at the end of the 20s, from Mark, Mark, Max Ernst to Paul Eluard and then the Surrealist. Later on during the war, the Prince Art Collection will be used by the Nazis for their 1937 exhibition on Tartete Kunst, Degenerated Art, that you can uh, see an example at uh, the New York Gallery in New York at the moment, along those of Beckman, uh, Dix, Klee, and Schwitters. So Prince Zorn established a research collection, which is different from Dubuffet, who established a collection based on aesthetic and soci sociological criteria. So I will continue the conversation on definition later on during uh, our uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom DiMaria from Creative Growth. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, Let's see, what am I gonna talk about? I think a lot about uh, who, what, who, is a, who is an artist, who can be an artist, and what is, um, what is an aesthetic experience. Um, I went to art school, and I wonder if that made me an artist. Um, I don't think so, necessarily. And I also think about what is an aesthetic experience. So if you've had this moment when you're in reading the book and you close it and you kinda can't move, or you're transfixed in front of a painting. Really, what is that? Is that an intellectual response? Is that an emotional response? And who can help create that experience for you? Does it have to be a trained artist? Can anyone um, have the privilege to be in that position? These are the words that I'm not gonna talk about. They're the labels we're gonna not use tonight. Labels are for clothes, but I'm sure we'll get to them in the discussion. But oddly, it was not until very recently that I looked up the definition of art in the dictionary, and it says it's from the Middle English, art, as in thou art. So it's an essential part of who we are. And also, then it goes on to say, art is the production, expression, or realm, according to aesthetic principles, of what is beautiful, appealing, or of more than ordinary significance. So I'm really taken by this part, more than ordinary significance. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to Creative Growth, where I work. I have the privilege of working here. Creative Growth, Oakland, California. That's our building. Founded in 1972, it's the largest and oldest art center for people with disabilities in the world. Um, we were founded in the Bay Area in 1972 when California made a decision that people with developmental and mental disabilities would no longer live in hospitals. So what are these people going to do? Our founders, who are artists, said, 
well, let's put paint in the garage in our home and see what happens. So they started to come and uh, make work there. All of us there, we have no training in disability. Um, we're all artists. This is our studio. And we, uh, you know, th think about the Bay Area in 72. Um, it was a time of social change. Hippies, Summer of Love, Black Panthers, all this was happening. And creative growth is born of those times. So what started in the home is now 162 artists who come to our studio every week and make work. And we have a gallery where we show it. As we look at some of the artists in the studio, I'm going to quickly answer what are usually the 10 most asked questions about what we do. Um, there's no fee for the artists to come and work with us. And we provide all the materials for free. How do they get to us? They find their way usually referrals from social workers, doctors, case managers, school outreach, church groups, anything we can. Um, they can come and work between one and five days a week. And some of the artists have been working with us five days a week for 38 and 39 years, one artist every day for 39 years without missing a day. So if you just think about the tenure of that artistic process, that's pretty substantial. Um, we are not art therapists, we're not trained in that, so we don't practice that, although we like to say that something therapeutic happens from what we do. And we don't really teach, we try to foster creativity by directing the person into a process of communication and aesthetic development. We believe that people with developmental disabilities have a, a rich culture to share and that art is a way for them to communicate that with us. We provide opportunity for all visual media, woodshop painting, drawing, printing, video animation, um, no performing arts. And yes, we sell the work and the artist receives half of the sale price and the other half goes to the nonprofit to buy supplies for the studio where they work. And we have the first three artists with developmental disabilities to have their work acquired by the uh, permanent collection here in New York by the Museum of Modern Art, and we're delighted about that. What does work cost? Starts at a dollar, goes up to 75,000. It's a wood shop, and we have a, um, uh, I don't know, is that a dollar, is that 75,000? That's pretty great, somebody's drawing on a table. Um, this is our gallery. We show uh, this. So if you're looking here, on the left side is where the studio is, and there's more classrooms upstairs. We change the work maybe every six weeks, and this is where people can come into the gallery and uh, buy work, see what our artists are up to. It's also a portal to the public to come in and meet our artists and see what they're doing and um, hopefully break down some of the stereotypes around disability. We have a visiting artist program. Uh, it's David Byrne who came and did a project with us last year. We also have an annual fashion show because we have a fashion department. So our artists make clothes and they, mo they model the clothes. <clears throat> and because we like to mix everything up, uh, the models are both creative growth models wearing the clothes and professional models who, um, hopefully you can't tell who's who. I'm gonna lose my voice one second. Thank you. Um, and our story is best told through some of our artists. Briefly meet Dan Miller. Dan is nonverbal, um, but his work is completely filled with words. So Dan's work is really an overlay obsessively of one word over the other. So if you can see um, in here ABCD up at the corner and other kinds of words that he does. Um, his work for me is pretty powerful because the form and the content are inseparable. One can't exist without the other. His language is the form and the form is the language. So if you look at Dan's work, his disability would not be known to you. And it's important that we see his work first and respond to it or not. But if we like it and we do respond to it, then his autism is definitely a part of his culture and a part of the influence from which the work comes from. These get very large, all again writing. His sister will tell us what the words reference from their childhood. <coughs> I'm sorry about my voice. Here's Dan, 
helping select work for um, a one-man show we had in Paris earlier this year. You can see the size of some of the paintings. And in general, we try to present work by creative growth artists in a contemporary context, not a disability context. This is Dan's work in a Chelsea gallery about two years ago. I want to introduce you now to William Scott, who I'm going to talk about for a few more minutes. Um, William likes to make a paper mache monster mask for himself every Halloween, and he was started early this year, so this is what he was doing last week, so I thought I'd share it with you so you can see what he's up to right now. Um, but typically, he does other things. And I want you to know that um, I talk about William with his permission. He's very proud of who he is and what his work is, and, um, and he's uh, attended lectures uh, with me. He's sorry not to be here today, but he doesn't like to travel. And what I've learned about his work, I've gathered from working with him uh, for every day for almost 15 years now. And I have this question about his life and who he is. And I think about what happens if you grow up in a... <clears throat> That's unfortunate. What happens if you grow up in a bleak and crime-ridden part of San Francisco in public housing with a dual diagnosis of a developmental disability and mental illness? And you're a really nice guy, so you want to change the world. And William wants to not only change his life, he wants to improve his neighborhood, erase his disability, end crime, create world peace, and have a nice girlfriend. <laughs> and his method for doing this is art. So how exactly should he proceed? Well, William's solution is actually to create a new world through his paintings. Paintings that he hopes are so powerful and compelling that the change will be inevitable. But they can't, uh, so it raises the question about if art can really change uh, a life. William calls himself an architect, not an artist, which is interesting, and here are the new worlds he's building. Reinvented San Francisco, where the past and the future combine and collapse upon each other to form these new worlds. So he'll take elements of the 50s and elements of the now and what he wants things to look like in the future and build them into one reality to, to change that. And there are certainly um, aesthetic patterns that result in his work from his disability. We often see that people on the autistic spectrum have an interest in detail, memorization of structures, and an interest in series and repetitions. And William certainly has this in his work. These are all done um, from memory. This is a building he loves in San Francisco called um, Fox Plaza. And we also see that in people with schizophrenia, there can be an ability to believe in a utopian, fantasized, or altered world. And William has that as well. In this case, um, that's the same building that Twitter headquarters has moved across from it, so the neighborhood's being re redeveloped, and William is redeveloping it as well, and is taking credit for the change in the city there. Um, William has his... Um, and here, this is a great example of how William uses paintings to change reality. This is, from memory, a, a painting of San Francisco G General Hospital. <coughs> the brick count, window count, all that is correct. And uh, he had a burn when he was a boy, and he had to go to the burn unit. So he's making a future new development of burning units. And he believes that by painting the hospital back in the day of this time, he can erase what happened historically to his body, take the incident away. And here he'll draw it again because maybe the first painting wasn't good enough because he still has the scar. So he will use work to go back in time and try to change it again. Just as he transforms the city again and again, this is a kind of actual size for this mural. It's probably about 10 feet long. He did a photorealistic painting of San Francisco and then whited it out and is rebuilding it in a way that's more pleasing for him. And he expects that to happen. He, you know, he doesn't have low goals. He wants to rename the whole world and make it a different place so it can become United States of Peace planning process, which will include California Love State, Janis, Janet Jackson Caribbean, Barack Obama town, handsome land, and Michael Jackson world. 
and he is a self-appointed world police planet patrol officer so he can make the world a better place. It's part of his mission. He also responds to popular culture. I don't know if Queen Latifah is wholesome, but she's certainly beautiful. His mother says, well, she probably won't go out with you, so you should lower your standards a little bit. So he's created a whole series of girlfriends that he calls citizen girlfriends, which are uh, more some of you'd meet on the street or at church or at school. And he paints these obsessively. She's in charge of the engagement party for him. And uh, I think that's more about what's going on around the pocket than it is about anything else. And this is a very interesting concept, inner limits. It's taken me 10 years to understand. These are people in his neighborhood that were killed through violence or drugs that come back to life in the spaceship and they're transformed from tough people into wholesome citizens. They're reborn through the painting. And William has reinvented his own life, so William becomes Billy the Kid, so in 1974, He's happy, he has no disability. He's a basketball player. 10 years later, he's on the Lakers, doing better. Now in middle age, he has a new friendship with his alter ego, the new black Jesus. And here, we see the scar on his chest on the left, gone on the right. He's reborn in a new life. He's painting the past away. He's changing his body. When I asked the question about can someone with a developmental disability challenge us intellectually, um, William challenges me intellectually every day. And uh, this is William at an opening of his work at White Columns Gallery here in the village a couple of years ago. And he was able to come out with his mom and sister and cousin with his own earnings for his show. And he struggles with how the work has not changed his reality, but he doesn't really see how the work has changed his reality, that he's an artist with these kinds of shows and how that's changed for him. And I'm always interested in how his paintings look more like reality than reality sometimes. Last little note, this is a, p a painting he made of Michael Jackson the morning after Michael died called Little Michael. And in it you see everything about William's work, I think, how in this one little boy there's the past and all the horrible future and all the terrible moment, it's all right there. You see in his eyes and in his shoulders, it's all about to unfold in the past and the future and the now exists at the same moment. And William had success with that and it got onto the cover of Modern Painters magazine. So we'll discuss after if William's making work of more than ordinary significance. And thank you for your time.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that technical difficulty. Hi, um, hi, I'm Jacoby Satterwhite, and today I want to um, give you insight on one of my biggest mentors, my thesis advisor, my favorite artist, and my mother, Patricia Satterwhite. Um, I'm going to try my best to describe her position as an um, as an artist, because she's not here, she's not, she's in South Carolina, she's not able to kind of um, articulate her position and her platforms of interest, so I'll try my best. So Patricia Satterwhite was born in Columbia, South Carolina, like myself, and um, as soon as I was born, she kind of raised me in this really culture at home. She took me to church like three times a week and made me, you know, perform in choir practice and the art classes in Bible school. And, you know, and at home we would make drawings together. I remember one of the things as a Sunday school teacher, well, she was a Sunday school teacher, but I wasn't in her class. But I remember one of the first discoveries in art was me being able to draw Jesus better than everyone else. <laughs> And it was kind of like something that pushed me forward. But she was never impressed <laughs> by my gestures artistically. Um, and it was like always an aspiration for me to kind of impress her. Um, so it was when my father, my father owned a grocery store in Columbia, South Carolina called Satterwhite's. And it was like a corner store. And we kind of were like, you know, upper middle class in a way, like we were very comfortable. And she had her Louis V bags and it was real cute. She was, <laughs> she was, she, she was kind of like um, the woman that she aspired to be on television, which was kind of the cast of Dynasty, um, which kind of manifested into the Kardashians for today. She loves the Kardashians now, which is really problematic. But <laughs> so, um, this is Patricia, and this is her drawing, and I'm gonna move forward. Um, so, when my father lost his grocery store, we went into an economical slump, and um, we had apps. We went from having, you know, what we wanted, consume, like as a, cons you know, American consumers, we had all the objects in the house that we wanted, to having no objects at all, having Christmases with no gifts. And I think, and my mother lost her job as well, and we just entered this um, kind of like class, cultural class slump that was a little bit unnerving for her. And so one of the first things that, she, you know, it kind of assaulted her psychologically and she, would ha she gained some kind of insomnia where she would stay up to five in the morning watching paid programs and infomercials from the Home Shopping Network in QVC and, you know, like those weird 1-800 um, commercials where they um, inform you that if you can come up with a good idea, you can earn a million dollars and they'll patent it. So she started to draw obsessively in color, very illustrative drawings um, of consumer objects that could eventually be patented and make us some money. <laughs> and when I was a kid, and and, and also, as a kid, I, you know, I thought this was real, and I thought these things were becoming invented because she was telling me they were invented. She was telling me she invented the computer. She was telling me so many things. And I would go to my teacher and be like, my mom, you know, she's making drawings on the Home Shopping Network. She's making drawings on QVC. Uh, I mean, she's making objects. She's inventing things. And my, they were like, why are you going to this low-grade elementary school? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, my mom is the shit. So, um, one of the things um, that I did <sighs> out, of, out of admiration for her, I begged her, um, I said, Mom, can you please allow me to help you? I was six years old, seven years old. I really want to help you make drawings. And she was like, well, you have to learn how to draw first. So I got all my manga comics and my Street Fighter books, and I, you know, I copied the line of Chun-Li and Cammy and all these like, you know, <laughs> comic characters from Marvels. You know, I tried to show my ability to, um, you know, have a sensitive line and work from observation. Eventually she saw that I had some kind of competence. I worked so hard to help her and then she said, you can finally use my glitter crayons and Crayolas and markers. And, <laughs> and it was like the world to me, I was like, yay, I can, 
So I went to town trying to help her make these inventions. And as I, as the years went by, I, I you know, you, you grow older and you see that something's not necessarily what you thought it was. And I kind of diverted into my own critical concerns as an artist at a very early age, trying to make paintings and drawings and trying to like learn how to become a graphic designer and make video games and how to, um, and I started to explore early then, I wanted to be a choreographer for Janet Jackson. So I just got in my own kind of creative bubble and we lived in an eccentric home in South Carolina that was kind of like, you know, in the woods where there was absolute, there was more public than, pri there was more private than public. And that private was mediated by a television, which is what brings me to this slide, which shows you how her sensibility is ingrained into my name. My mom is a surrealist at heart. She's been playing Exquisite Corpse without the knowledge of the pretentious game of Exquisite Corpse. My name is based on Dynasty, the two, the Colbys, my brother who would make her popcorn Jablonski while she was watching Dynasty. And then after Dynasty went off, CBS News came on and they were, you know, covering the Iraq and Iran war where most of the bombings took place in Tehran, which, let me just show this video first. Oh, sorry, we don't have sound. Oh my God. Sound, come on, we gotta get sound so it could be funny. <laughs> Oh, God. I'm not going to compromise. <laughs> yeah. Well, <sighs> it's not playing. Well, I guess it's not necessary. Okay, it's okay, it's fine. Well, you get the point. Um, so, yeah, it basically, a combination of Jablonski, the Colbys, and Tehran made Jacoby Tehran Satter White. So my, that's this, you know, and that sensibility, you know, maintained itself in the drawings. My mother kind of watched a lot of television. She watched The Bold and the Beautiful and Home Shopping Network, and now she's watching The Kardashians and Jessica Simpson and Tori, whoever, she's just like consumed by white ladies with money who are really bored. <laughs> and um, who also make, you know, have design companies, but they maintain these companies while having affairs <laughs> constantly, you know, like she loves that. And you know, I think that's interesting when, you know, television and the media and pop culture and the simulacra of like Google, all of that can like literally store information into our heads and it can bleed out content later if you allow it to. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of like we're constantly making this like digital sculpture uh, manifested through television and the internet. And I just find that fascinating that, you know, um, oh man, can, we can't get sound. Sucks. Never mind. So I'm going to skip this video, but I made a video. So she also made soundtracks. Um, <laughs> She made several albums as well, um, kind of aspiring to, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of having a moment. Oh, okay. Yeah, the volume is up. It's okay, I'm just gonna talk. I'm sorry. We're gonna have to switch up the talk a bit. It, it did it before, okay. Um, So that previous slide, all right, I'm just gonna be honest. Okay, here we go. So what you're supposed to be hearing is my mother uh, singing this song about opulence and gaining material cultural wealth while I perform on Fifth Avenue in front of storefronts for like five hours, which was my first gestural performance piece reacting to her archive of drawings and sound pieces. Um, I felt like using, initially I didn't have a sentimental um, position with her work. I just was um, these uh, language scores for me to figure out how to make artworks. And so this is one of the first things I did. Um, this 
kind of shows how she made these drawings without seeing episodes like of the Home Shopping Network like this, but this is the same object that you see in the drawing that is in the actual episode, which actually manifests itself in this like family photograph of my brother using a knife that kind of looks like a katana blade. It's a funny video, but unfortunately we don't have sound. Um. So eventually after I went to art school, <laughs> What happened? Well, I guess it's yeah. It's, a second. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I feel like it's not no, flowing. Okay. Hi, guys. How you feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard Lana Del Rey's new album? It's really good. <laughs> I'll, I'll just talk about, since I want, I want my 10 minutes, so I'm gonna talk, continue talking. So we're looking at the Matriarch's Rhapsody right now. And I wanna talk about why I ended up like literally tracing 300 drawings by her um, and making a codex. It was because, you know, like I told you earlier, I deviated from making um, drawings for her to making my own art and, 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 and um, being inspired by pop cultural norms and, uh, video games and literature and painting. And um, I went to boarding school and I went to art school and I got really concerned with like, you know, Western history and figuring out how to make the perfect composition and failing constantly because, you know, the identity of being black and gay and being so drowned in such a loaded identity, I literally had, I didn't have enough anonymity with my identity to have agency, to make, the perfect composition because people are constantly trying to align me with an impressionist or a um, renaissance painter or a modernist or a conceptual artist or a black artist who I would respect from the 90s or 80s or you know it was always some kind of like tangent always some kind of parallel and I and through the struggle to find autonomy as a painter I found failure but what I end up realizing that the person who was winning was my mother I went back home for Christmas one day and saw her continuing to make these drawings that I didn't believe in throughout my teenage years. And I saw, oh my God, this woman has all the line weight, all the delicacy, all of, like she literally has the most sophisticated line that I've seen in the past four years of my undergrad practices and my grad school practices. Like, and I want that. It comes from a place of necessity. It comes from a place that keeps her schizophrenia in control. It comes from a place where her mind, she's, you know, has six voices in her head, but once her graphite hits that paper, it becomes one voice in her head. And I said, I want art to come from that place. I want art to come from a place where it's an emergency for me to survive. And it's an also a place um, that is not trying to be postmodern and clever and parallel myself with the public space. And so I started to allow her to become my thesis advisor. I started tracing them constantly and performing them, using the language in them to act as performance art scores. Um, she had a drawing of football objects and I would like build sculptures of football objects and host this like, live performance. And then eventually I realized um, through practicing animation processes that I could trace and build her drawings um, in 3D animation. And I can also practice all of my concerns with painting, like color and line, and I can create these arenas that look like Pierre Della Francesca's, which, I, wait, is the sound working? No. Oh, that's okay. So we're gonna skip my cultural alchemy, which shows Janet Jackson videos, Bjork videos, Madonna, video games, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so it's funny, you know, it became full circle where after, you know, uh, working with my mother's drawings for many years, my work, I, then, I, I started making the compositions that I was striving to make, trying to assimilate, when I was trying to assimilate to like painting paradigms. And you see Hieronymus Bosch, Garden of Earthly Delights. Then you see this piece that I did for When the Stars Begin to Fall. And I'm so proud of it because I'm having my candy and I'm eating it too because of my thesis advisor, Patricia Satterwhite, who taught me that I can make these, um, 
through starting from the place of complete purity, which is your own body, which is my, which is my performative body, the place that no one else owns but me and my own personal archive, which is Patricia, my family photographs, my surrealist Google searches, all the archives that I build you know, as an artist, is I learned how to be an artist because of her, because I learned that, um, I just did. I don't even have to get really smart about it, but anyway. <laughs> so I wanna share, oh, there's no sound, okay. Weird, okay, so let's talk about, so one of the first projects that kinda like resolved itself, and I'm almost done, was Country Ball 1989, 2012, where I wanted to appropriate a family, a camcorder video from the 80s. Because one thing that my mother was doing was trying to restore a moment of middle class kind of like comfort. That's why I used the fam and, 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 and um, all the drawings were of recreational objects like slides and carousels and pools and Jeep cars and vans and you know, things that you know, Americans own in order to make, to paint a portrait of comfort. And I thought, well, how can I paint a landscape of comfort using, by tracing all of her drawings that existed in this home video from the 80s made by a cheap camcorder and make a 3D animation using the same material culture and it creates a painterly performance arena and I can multiply my body 500 times trying to re-articulate and re-perform this document Re and reperformance was such a like trend then you know you, you know marina was doing the vito conchi pieces and you know like art, collecting the performance was such a big thing in the museum and the institution conversation and i'm like what would it mean for me to collect a performance from the 1980s made on a camcorder of a mother's day picnic in the woods where my brother bought my brother my gay brother brought a, a gay club CD from the Paradise Garage to South Carolina for my blue collar, you know, homophobic family to dance to, which is a lot. I just said a lot just now, but <laughs> but that's what you're saying. <laughs> so, you know, everything becomes repurposed. Everything becomes queered. Everything expands, and it's just it allows me to understand that you know. I think I have the most control now and as I've ever had before and it's because of her. And unfortunately, I can't show you this video which talks about like America, patriarchy and race. It's a, it's a quote from Paris is burning. And it kind of acts as a like, um, and it almost acts like a, a portrait of the experience that Patricia went through that made her make the drawings that she's making now. And I hope that was cohesive enough for you guys. I love you all. <laughs> and I'm done. Thank you guys for really fantastic um, presentations on this subject that seems to me to be especially, uh, and also thanks to the Studio Museum team for inviting us here today to, to uh, have this conversation. I, I feel like it's one that doesn't get um, uh, done enough. So one of the things that it occurred to me was that in the Studio Museum in Harlem where we're sitting, we're kind of dealing with uh, multiple complexities, right? So we're dealing with um, talking about artists who are otherly disabled, who are, in the context of this exhibition, are uh, of African descent, who are, in the context of um, the art historical canon, and certainly institutions that uh, typically don't show this work, or specialized institutions, such as yours, that show this work. So there's a lot that I feel like um, can, is, is loaded and implicated in having a discussion like this in, in 125th Street in this space. Um, and to me, it seems that the purview of the discussion, um, it's really important, and you'll notice that I will probably not use terms like disability. Uh, I like to think of them as um, otherly abled bodies, as that which to, that helped us think a little bit about what becomes possible when people who are creating um, their own worlds in ways in which they're outside the norms uh, of the way society feels is acceptable for this kind of creation. So I think that that's a really interesting um, and important point to make. 
And we'll talk about terms really specifically, but I actually wanted to, in the context of uh, speaking about this kind of way of getting beyond these binaries of insider, outsider, um, trained, untrained artist. Uh, there was a uh, one term, because there were many terms that were tossed about, <laughs> that was, um, you know, I, we've seen flashed up in, in presentations today, self-taught, outsider artist, uh, art brute, primitive, vernacular. Uh, Lynn Cook has uh, referred to it as outlier art. Um, and I came across a term that was, in fact, and I think it was Catherine Gentleson's uh, essay in the catalog, that used the word visionary art. And I thought that that was super interesting because if you follow the 18th century old French etymology of, of visionary, it says, able to see visions, one who engages in impractical fantasies, something seen in the imagination, presence, dream, supernatural sight. And what I thought was super interesting from these originary meanings of this term is that it's actually not about the functionality of sense at all. And in fact, it, it, it sets aside this kind of function of sense for a different way of thinking the world. So maybe I can start with you, Valerie, and, and if you would speak to um, this notion of terminology uh, in describing this art, your own perspective, and in particular, if you would speak to the usefulness or um, a, a position, if you will, in relation to just calling it contemporary art, or not? That's a huge question, but um, I mean, terms are historical and we are using them because they are convenient and because they are related to uh, uh, the moment they have been uh, created. Uh, in the context of Jean Dubuffet, and it's the reason why I feel comfortable and more uh, I think it's more clear when we are using the term art brut, for instance, it's because it's associated to a collection. Uh, I think in this field of, I mean, the field I am, uh, eh, we are seeing a lot of terms, expressions, definitions that are unclear, uh, that, can, that are used, uh, that are not convenient, and that we are struggle with. Um, and I, I, was, um, I was talking with someone the other day and he was saying, but why are we not using the word outsider? Finally, we are not agreeing with this term, but at the end, we know what we are talking about when we are referring to that. So it's really like a, a, a difficult, um, uh, we are struggled with these terms, but at least when we are talking about Arbut, we are referring to an historical definition we are, with a specific uh, context of um, of emergence and it's also related to a specific collection which is kind of rare in our field um, and even the definition evolved uh, in Lausanne uh, the collection is not anymore a couple of thousand works but 60,000 works uh, in their collection uh, they have been obliged to revisit the term to think about it and other uh, organizations start to um, to take the lead on, on those uh, studies and see how this term can <coughs> be uh, applied to cultures that are not Western cultures, for instance. And so it's, it's really like a, uh, a very interesting debate that is happening uh, also now and it's not, uh, it's not uh, done. We don't have like one term that can be inclusive of all these uh, artworks. But one thing is sure, I don't think that the contemporary art world is more inclusive. I don't think that calling these works contemporary art would be uh, the solution because I don't think this is this is uh, uh, inclusive enough. I, I think in contemporary art world is also fragmented in in many institutions that are dominant culture uh, that are supported by uh, by uh, a lot of of, uh, of interest that are drained uh, that are maintained by the art market and by uh, extremely rich collectors. And I don't think that it's the solution to include <coughs> all <laughs> the artists under the same package of, of contemporary art. I don't think it doesn't make any sense. I think they are different artists from different backgrounds. And I think <coughs> the are useful sometimes to 
uh, explore the difference of those different uh, creations because this is not all the same. They are different. It's interesting. I was really, when I got your PowerPoint, I think it was like yesterday, I was like shocked because I said, ah, oh, I'm on the right track because you had this image of um, from Andre Beton's collection. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot and doing a lot of work um, in relation to surrealism in the African diaspora uh, within its period and well beyond. And I was certainly, I was really intrigued by this notion of the quality of this work as having some kind of being imbued with some kind of quality, right? That was the kind of elan vital or that they seem to have be possessed with, with something that we can find in certainly the usefulness of a certain kind of uh, imagery and iconography and uh, a language around that was found in surrealism, right? Um, and, and so in many ways, I think about the expression of this work particularly in the context of um, artists of color, perhaps, as, as this notion of the fantasy, this notion of the marvelous, this notion of what we're talking about when we say the enchanted. Um, and and as, as this kind of work is being really imminent, right, is actually proceeding, as being that quality, perhaps, in surrealism that we're expressing here. And in many ways, I want to link it to the exhibition that was um, shown here prior to this show. Uh, it was called um, Naima's Exhibition, when, what shadows was it? when Shadows Took Shape as She's Walking Out the Door. <laughs> um, yeah, and how this also is so distinctly related in terms of using a certain aesthetics, then that aesthetics is actually a politics to kind of get beyond the everydayness of a certain kind of lived experience or a certain kind of reality that we then find in Afrofuturism. So they're kind of these really interesting reverberations through all of these things. Um, and I just wanted to mark that for the purpose of our discussion today. And Jacoby, did you have thoughts in relation to what you, the way you think about the art that your mother is making and the ways in which, in terms of the terms and your relationship oh, yeah. to that? Well, definitely. In the beginning, um, a lot of people wanted her drawings to be in visionary museums or in Baltimore and stuff like that. And I wasn't. I don't. I, I'm not interested in the divide because, like, from all of my research of early modernism and late modernism, and uh, you know, I read concerning the spiritual by Kandinsky and Point Line to Plane, and that that's like the similar kind of vernacular that comes from an outsider artist, like people who, and Clement Greenberg, and people who wrote these bizarre manifestos about like formal principles that are supposed to have like some weird spiritual connectivity. It's the same thing that my mother says when she sees Northwest inside of, a, you know, like it's, <laughs> she does, she says she, says she sees people in her crystalline abstractions. But um, I just think that the eccentric jargon and a lot of like um, theory especially like if you look at Donald Judd's writing, it's a similar kind of like wacky vernacular that they kind of paint onto the term visionary, just like you described, people who see things spiritually that, you know, people who, you know, like they kind of like, it's the same thing. The difference between an outsider artist and an insider artist is that an insider artist navigates a social ecosystem and galas and parties and they kind of find themselves placed in you know, very mainstream shows. An outsider artist works differently, and Henry, they'll get picked up like Henry Darger and maybe placed more frequently. But I don't think that's a difference. So it was always my mission to kind of make sure she is, you know, not assimilated, but f I don't know, I'm fighting against that. Because there is, I find like it's all bullshit sometimes, and I want to blur the lines. And so it was my mission to kind of like. The divisions are The bullshit. division, yeah. I just found the division bullshit and it's all like weird propaganda based on my own art history studies. And I was just like, this is not, this doesn't make any sense. So I wanted her to have the same platform that I had. And it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't about elevating because I'm not elevating anything. She's already elevated, but it was about curating, I guess. So that's my point of view. It was just like knowing people from before, just knowing like, just reading a lot of theory and realizing it's all like some weird, it's kind of like culty and churchy, like the way when you kind of like, you know what I mean? Well, and then some, theatric, some theoretical 
theatricality is right. Yeah, that's right. Some theoretical um, concepts actually come out of experiences, right? Like you think about the work that uh, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari did together, they did together yeah. in an asylum in, in France. Um, a lot of the concepts they developed, the like schizoanalysis were developed actually, these huge theoretical tomes that become so prolific were developed in that context. Tom, did you have a feeling about that? Yes, I do. Um, I have feelings about everything. Um, the, uh, I don't think the words serve the field. Yeah, and I think that uh, the historically artists lead the culture, and I think our artists are leading the culture in a way that there aren't words for. And I think when we look back at this time and this era, we'll see really what words emerge that describe what's happening, um, is how I would look at it. I don't refer to our artists as outsiders because people with disabilities live outside of culture so much and they're so marginalized that that, that doesn't help them. Um, contemporary, I, how can you say somebody working in a studio every day is not a contemporary artist? And I mean, they're there working. I tend to say that it's work by, um, I don't necessarily call what they make contemporary art as much as I say they're, it's work by a contemporary artist because that's what they are. And, uh, you know, I have this theory that looking back What's on... What's that distinction for you, though, between... I think, I think if you're making contemporary art, you have a, an awareness of the object in its relationship to art history. And I think about our artists as not having a relationship to art history, and that's the difference. So they're, they're contemporary makers, but they're making outside of a context of a historical reference point. Um, and that's what's important for me. That's what I find interesting and refreshing. That's where I see the artistic genesis and the, really the brilliance of what somebody is doing to have that voice and under, have that connectivity to what it is that makes anyone that wants to be an artist find that voice. Um, I like to think um, that artists like creative growth artists and other artists that we're kind of discussing are in the show are really gonna be the artists of our era when we look back at this era. Um, and what words we'll use to describe them, I don't know. Why do you feel that? Uh, because I think they really are resonating with the um, culture that we live in where everything is mediated and referenced and postmodern and triple referenced and um, overthought, contextualized, commercialized, that these artists who, for the most part, can't, won't um, respond to those things. And I just think that it's a particular moment in time whether, whether that makes it counterculture or whether that makes it um, sort of brilliant. I mean, it might be a flash in the pan in terms of this was the last hurrah of art for process sake, you know, that wasn't commercialized in a way by the artists themselves. Or it may be the turning of the tide a little bit in a trend that continues through an increasingly complicated future. But have you ever thought that this is like, it's funny how we're in a zeitgeist moment where we're recognizing quote unquote outsider artists more than before. And I'm wondering if that has to do with this like democratic internet that, you, with, that we call YouTube and that we call Tumblr, where everyone has authorship and curation and creative like platforms to kind of be better than, like it's kind of like the art world started protecting itself all of a sudden because these random Nebraska people were doing something way more compelling. Well, I think what happened, well, I mean, you know, there was a huge, there are people who know way more about this than I do here. It's not my area of expertise, um, this notion. But I, the first exhibition I ever worked on in my life, I was a curatorial intern uh, with Max Anderson at the Carlos Museum in 1996 when Souls Grown Deep and Thornton Dial, where exhibitions were presented in Atlanta as part of the Olympic Games. And so there was a huge resurgence around this time in the like late 80s, early 90s around um, so-called um, outsider art. And then you have this kind of resurgence again, right? And in, in like the last couple of years. And I, I really don't know why that is. Does anyone have an opinion from the audience? Well, there are earlier exhibits too. Yeah. Like Alfred Barr and the Corcoran exhibit. So yeah. you're right, it's sort of like little jets of air coming It's more like a, um, an accumulation of, uh, of <coughs> projects and exhibitions uh, that we are seeing for the last maybe uh, 10 years. I don't know if it's, it's something that will stay, something that will be establishing 
uh, a new generation of um, uh, viewers or historians who will reference these artworks. I think more you see them, more they are penetrating uh, um, our um, imaginary and they are, uh, uh, we can talk about them, they are, we are educating these, uh, these young students, scholars about these art. I don't know if it's something that will uh, really be effective or it will just pass as fashion uh, do. So I, I think that history shows that these artworks have been revealed in many, um, in many occasions for the last 150 years. Uh, the difference, I mean, the step, uh, this, the difference uh, with what Du Buffet did, I think, in 1945, when uh, was that he, he, he built a collection and he created a moment, and he didn't just like incorporate these artists in his own uh, in, in his own artistic platform, uh, in his exhibitions as uh, Breton would do, you know, with the wall behind uh, his desk. Uh, it's it's really like a, a different statement, uh, and he he played the game of creating a museum uh, like collection aside the institutions, but with um, uh, without the idea that institutions are not uh, the solution to create a, a new concept. He really used the, uh, the institution uh, and the codes of the institution to create, to create this concept. But it's really like these um, seminal moments uh, happened way before uh, today, but I think that today the difference is that uh, they are more, they are coming from different platforms, and uh, they seem to touch the public differently, and it's true that because of internet, the information is passing vividly, like faster to different ends. Um, I actually wanted, I had this question for you, Tom, that I wanted to talk to ask you. Um, there is a, an autistic, autistic uh, activist who really beautifully, and I thank Thomas for this suggestion actually, because I was really, I wanted to speak through someone who was creating and, um, and whose voice reflected this experience. And she has a fabulous video that um, is quite moving and informative on uh, YouTube, so you should see it. Her name is Amanda Baggs, and it's called In My Language. And I'll just quote her, and then I have a very brief question for you. People claim that I am opening up to true interaction in the world. They judge my existence, awareness, and personhood on which, on a tiny and limited part of the world, I appear to be reacting to. The way I naturally think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all. But it is a way of thinking in its own right. However, the thinking of people like me is only taken seriously if we learn your language, no matter how we previously thought or interacted. I find it very interesting that that failure to learn your language is seen as a deficit, but failure to learn my language is seen as so natural that people like me are officially described as mysterious and puzzling, rather than anyone admitting that it is themselves who are confused, not autistic people or other cognitively disabled people who are inherently confusing. And this is a woman who uh, goes through the world by tasting pens, by smelling things that she hears. She, she experiences, and you'll see this in the video if you watch it, things in an entirely different way, in ways that we're told you should not or could not, right, experience it. And it's actually really beautiful and poetic. And you've used the term, what you called cultures of disability, um, in the past, and I wondered if you would articulate what you mean by that in relation to this quote. Sure, I mean, it's interesting. In many ways, my response to the quote is that, isn't that what artists do? I mean, isn't artists an uh, artist's job to mediate experience and culture and bring their own point of view or their own sensibility to the world to, uh, for us all to learn from it and experience it? So whether that's because you, you're marginalized, whether you're autistic or whatever, I think that's the brilliance of it, of 
uh, an artist that can transcend that kind of language. In terms of the culture of disability and the culture of the maker, I think um, what is really interesting for me, uh, traveling and meeting artists with disabilities in similar centers on the creative growth model around the world. You know, I'll be in, you know, in Japan with a studio with six artists and I'll see somebody with Down syndrome doing something that's exactly like that woman in, with Down syndrome in Belgium is doing. And there's something about the methodology and, and the, the style or the repetition or the, the folding or the touching or the bundling of the work or different kind of linear patterns I'll see in, um, you know, uh, Colombia in a program there and then in, in Denmark and with people with autism and this kind of thing. And I think these are people that culturally, in terms of what we might describe as culture traditionally, country of origin, language, race, religion, ethnicity, they're completely different and they often don't even access media. But there's something in this uh, artistic or visual language that they're using that is a shared culture with a people like them. So is there a community of artists with autism or artists with um, Down syndrome or artists with cerebral palsy whose work resonates in a way where they're a, sort of a global culture or community? And I'm really fascinated by that. I've been looking for examples of it and people don't really, have, have not really studied it and I realize that I see it probably more than most people. So I think her quote references that in some ways. And um, for me, the, the kind of eureka moments in you know, these kinds of experiences are seeing that. And it's like you know, the really simplistic way that I understand it is I don't read Chinese. So, but if I see it written on a page, I know that it has meaning. Um, I've been trained to become media literate so I can understand media or art literate in a way so I can read art, but there are things that I can't understand. And that doesn't mean that they're without meaning, that just means I can't get it. So when I start to see some of these cultures um, and what comes forward in terms of the artist statement, and it's usually linked clearly to a form of communication, I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, Jacoby, I was really curious, um, thank you for really talking about how you make your work and where it's coming from and sharing <coughs> Patricia's, your experience with her um, as a son, as an artist. I really wanted to know what you, especially in this moment where you've just been in the Whitney Biennial, your work is being shown internationally, I'm really wondering from both a place of an artist and a son, right? Like, how do you, how do you deal with, what do you feel are the ethical implications for the ways in which you work and protect and make this work, make this work with your mother, carry this forward? I'm just very interested. Oh, well that's been like, where I'm at right now. And um, when I first started working with her archive of materials, um, it was just a reaction from working so autonomously on with the painting practice. And so for me, I had a very bird's eye view, a very distant, non-objective kind of like way of using her material and the language and the text and the objects to kind of pivot performances and images. As that body of work got more attention publicly, especially now, the audience has widened significantly and the critics have um, reacted to me more intensely. I'm starting to see my life articulated in ways that I don't want, I don't, find, I don't approve of. And I find, I mean, I'm into wearing my heart on my sleeve. One of my favorite artists is Tracy Emin. <laughs> Cause she uses like, she curates her mythology in such a like interesting way. And now, and this is gonna be a little tangent. Like, let me just go on this random tangent. My heroes are Tracy Emin, Bruce Nauman, Andy Warhol, and Joseph Boyes because they all deal with personal mythology in four different ways. Where Bruce Nauman, his body is a modernist object and he references his name, his, the measurement of his arm. How do you say Bruce? How you, you know, it's just like, it's such an interesting way where you can take the like really fundamental formalist parts of your identity and make them into a uh, content or a medium. And Andy Warhol took his public point of view 
which of pop culture and the superstar and all the camp and queer tendencies and turned them into like this, you know, thing. He mediated that. And that's fascinating. You know, the death paintings, oh my God. And then we talk about Joseph Boys, which I relate to the most because he turns you know, the myths of the war and the rabbit, you know, like all that, you know, so I realized if you, archiving your own personal and public history was an interesting system for being an artist for me. And so I had a very dense and important one that I felt like, it's just, you couldn't avoid it. I grew up as a child watching my dad go to CVS to buy, well, tar, uh, Refco actually, to buy typing paper for my mom every week for her to draw 500 drawings a week. That's, um, and they, they were really strong drawings. So obviously this is something, this is, a, this is something that is very, this is, some, this is something. But it's become exploited in a way that's really hard. It's hard to protect it. It's hard to protect how people sensationalize you. It's hard for people to protect what you, know, you put out there, but I just have to be brave. And that's all I can do is embarrass myself and be brave. And embarrassment and living, like diving off of a cliff face first is the best way to gain longevity as an artist. Because if you're trying to like pamper yourself in this neat and tidy like, you know, career, then that's not gonna, you're not gonna have a momentum. And I just feel like for me, I have something to say. And I don't know, it hurts. Sometimes I hate the way people talk about my mom in the media. I hate the way they talk about me. I feel really like scared. I feel scared to like talk to her about it. I mean, it, I tell her everything. You do. Yeah. I tell her everything, but it's just like I don't. It's just a. It's a. That's a longer conversation. It's definitely something that burdens me, and it's strange how my personal and public and professional life have all blurred so intensely. It's kind of unhealthy. I'm just being very honest. Like I feel very vulnerable in this way where I wake up in the morning and I'm making art. I'm making art because my life has become my art in this way. And it's just odd. It's so, it's like, I can't even, we just have, I don't want to talk, I mean, like I'll keep going, so. <laughs> but it's a long conversation, that's all I have to say. And it's, a, and it's a one that I would love to have, but I know we're on the time limit, so I'm just gonna cut myself off right now. I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience at this point. One thing that I just wanted to to uh, to talk about briefly, uh, I think that the experience that Tom has uh, day after day at Creative Growth Art Center, uh, and your experience as an artist, uh, and the experience art historians are having with artwork in museums are quite different. I think that the fact that they are in direct connections with those artists, and they are um, living with them, and they are understanding. Uh, the creative process, I mean they are aware of the creative process, makes them much more aware of those uh, definition problems that we all have uh, today and in museums specifically uh, we tend to exhibit works without having, I mean in our museums because many of the artists are, are, are not living artists, I think that this is really like the difficulty of many of, of ours to that be connected with the field. And I think that by knowing many of those um, uh, untrained artists, self-artists uh, on, on the field makes, makes, will make the field evolving differently also. Right? And this question of definition is getting more, um, uh, I would say like, uh, aware of all those concerns. I mean, as a curator, do you feel, I mean, I'm curious about your own feelings around the ethics of curating material created and work created by artists. I'm sorry, what is the question? Your own ethical um, kind of feeling. I mean, how do you feel ethically implicated or responsible in any way in terms of presenting these works? In, Absolutely. In I, I feel like it's it's really something that, uh, I started, my, my interest in that field started by doing research on the field and trying to find a new artist. So, um, I've met a lot of, the, uh, of, of these individuals and, uh, and tried to enter their world and coming back to them when, when you were mentioning about uh, Scott that it took, like, it took you 10 years to understand. It's true that more you are seeing them, speaking with them, you, you, you keep um, having a different, you enlarge your understanding of, of each of, of those uh, practices. But it's really like um, 
uh, this is, is constantly with me when I'm building my exhibitions in how I, I should keep in mind uh, this connection of those artworks to their living space. And one thing that I've been very interested about is how those artists exhibited those artworks in their own environment. Uh, uh, what plays out, you know, one question that, that was burning uh, my, my lips when I was listening to you is like, if your mom was, was very directive, was very um, specific about how you would exhibit or put his works in context of your own practice. Uh, I'm very interested in, in how they are displaying their, their objects around, how they are talking about those objects, but repeatedly after many conversations, the, the, the discussions are much more intense and much more um, uh, enlightening. And so that, that, that aspect of my, of my experience with those artists is following me in my curatorial practice. But it's funny that you say that. I thought about how like, because I'm slowly curating a couple of drawings out of thousands that were made. So whenever I bring back the way that I curated those moments, she doesn't ever remember ever making that work. And she's like, um, she'll say, this is your work, because I don't remember making that. Because <laughs> I, you know, I make 200 drawings a day, so 100 drawings a day. And, it was in, it's interesting how like because I have such a glacial experience with something that she has such a speedy experience with it, it does make me think about if she was directing it like they just be in trash like she puts them in these trash bags and puts them in the attic and let oh, them collect. That's very interesting. But um, anyway, that's what I was gonna say. For that. Um, I was thinking about the ones. Great. I'm gonna give you the mic. I have a lot of thoughts, so I, mean, I hope I'll be able to articulate them into a question. Um, as a student of art history, I do not like to, or at least um, I don't, I don't content myself, uh, or I cannot content myself with just the visual pleasure of seeing the work. I would like to understand the principles the artist lives by, or the dreams he or she has. And with um, out, so-called outsider art. Um, who are marginalized, um, the artists of which are marginalized into the outskirts of the society and whose principles and dreams remain obscure to us. Um, I was just wondering how one can um, actually um, understand them and create a narrative for them, with them. Uh, I think that's why I find Jacoby's uh, practice so interesting. So inspiring um, in one way, um, but uh, I, I was just wondering what are your thoughts about this since um, you're thinking obviously a lot about uh, these matters. How can the greater public can be um, you know, educated or somehow um, we can shed this illusion of mainstream culture and be more integrated with those that are marginalized. I guess that is, I'm sorry, I guess this is probably good for, um, or I feel like people might be repeating them, might feel like they're repeating themselves with uh, what we have seen the you know, gay histories or like feminist histories, but still I think, you know, outsider art is still a very different case than those. I mean, one of the questions I had actually for this group that I think is maybe perhaps related to your first part of your mm -hmm. inquiry, which is, um, is there an over, say, a, a heightened interest and in overly weighted towards biography, towards the artist's biography, right, with this kind of work? Is it, is it somehow made susceptible to kind of an interest in knowing all the ins and outs of their personal lives and their stories. I mean, are we overly reliant on that? It's kind of a, it's a question, right, that I had for these guys, because I was thinking about, you know, because I'm thinking about this work so much in relation to the art historical canon, particularly in terms of modernism and how there's always this, this presupposition that somehow there's this distance, right? And, and so I was wondering if, if you had an opinion um, related to that, 
And in, in light of this gentleman's mm -hmm. good question. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that I'm obsessed with you know biographical yeah. details of the artist, but yeah. you know with people who have been integrated into the art historical canon, you have this you know narr con continual narrative. But with outsider artists, that you know remains uh, uninvented at least uh, for the moment being. That's why um, I'm relying on. It's a huge know. issue, and I think that you know. I, uh, we try to lead with the work without biography, and if you're interested, then there's a story, and that's um, in this context, context and reference like there is for any artist. But people will fight you for it. People will fight you for the biography and want to know before they look. And, you know, um, particularly one of the problems I have with the words outside of this, it addresses part of your question, which is it takes away the more complicated understanding of process and individuality and how a person approaches um, it, um, the process of creation because we want to categorize it too quickly into this person's imaginary and this person's schizophrenic and this person's uh, object maker and this person works in a folk tradition as opposed to, oh, this is a really complicated experience and I don't really know what to think of the work yet. And as I mentioned, sometimes it takes years of working with the artist and you know, in the field we work in, there's not a lot of artist statements. You're looking at the process and what gets created, and it's kind of for somebody else to decide if we want to discuss the objects. But there are so many times when we're approached to do exhibitions, and people want, you know, the photograph of the artist in the wheelchair. That's going to be the cover of the book. You know, and you just have to really, really resist that. And I'm not sure if that's about um, making it simple, like this is the idea or if it's somehow, I don't think it elevates the artist at all, but it, it, um, um, it's a different kind of label making and it uh, keeps us from really trying to understand the complexity of what individuals are doing in a really interesting way. It seems to be like the starting point where, where people want to start to uh, understand Judith Scott, for instance. And I think that after five years, <laughs> 10 years and 15 years, we are going further in the uh, understanding of the work. I think it's for the first yes. time viewer, they want to know that story. It seems like to be the entrance point. Uh, and, uh, but uh, between, you know, when we are just the, the James Castle, book, many great uh, books have been written uh, on James Castle uh, lately. And I think that uh, more we go further in the research on a specific artist, less we are just relying on those biographical aspects. But we should not forget also that biographies are collections of experiences. And I think it's not irrelevant. It's really important. And also, it, it just like, it, we should not just uh, also establishing a caricature about what the biography is. It's yeah. also uh, relevant in many ways. And bi biographies have shaped all great contemporary artworks, even if it's Barnett Newman's boring paintings of lines. He saw a fucking skyscraper and decided he was interested in verticality. That's an autobiographical <laughs> experience and it related to the way he shaped his craft. When I talk about Patricia, she sat in front of a 25 inch television and saw consumer products being sold constantly and white ladies on reality shows. And fictions of like ideal lives and they end up making scientific schematics of how to appropriate those lives. It's no such thing as like some people do sensationalized by it's that's depending on the viewer. But my experience as an artist, even though my work is heavily personal, it also is influenced by extremely public things. And I like to create friction. I, that's why I like destabilizing um, people's expectations of me. And I, I take these really personal archives very disposably and make really. Um, like my, the video on the biennial was completely, like my process is just not just Patricia's archive. I outsource performances from people in Soho and I, you know, download Tumblr images. I, I draw, I make, you know, I'm, I, I have like 10 different archives and I write constantly and I write surrealist essays and then I find ways to articulate them in photography, drawing, sculpture, and performance and video and a lot and it it's 
And most of the time when I screen them, some half of the audience doesn't even know anything about my autobiography, but they're still engaging in the work. The work has to be strong enough to like have a blind engagement in the first place. But everyone needs somewhere to start. I wouldn't have ne I didn't go to school for anything I'm doing right now. I taught myself because my spirit was on fire when I found how when I just the urgency to get the narrative out. Knowing how important the auto mythography <laughs> Know how important my mom is, know how important what she did, know how important what... I just felt like there was something very important about what I had to say. And they kept me up at 7 in the morning reading a Maya manual, YouTube tutorials, and learning my craft autonomously without a teacher. Because you have to have somewhere to start. And that's what I gotta say about that. But every great work of art had... Warhol went to Catholic church and Catholic school, and that's why all his celebrities have Byzantine icon backgrounds that look like in Technicolor. Like everyone works from that place, you know, auto, yeah. internal. Anyway, sometimes maybe the emphasis is heavier on others than the in, uh, <coughs> in the uh, exhibition Self Taught Genius, which Valerie is one of the co curators. The catalog, we made a very distinctive decision. There are two brilliant essays at the beginning of the catalog. But then the rest of the catalog is only illustration. In fact, the name of the artist, the name of the work, is not even underneath the work of art. It's like a page beyond, or five or six things are shown. It's all in the back. Because we wanted people just to look. Because I think we all agreed that if you get so much into the German art historical uh, canons, which many of us were, you know, had to study in, you forget you're looking at an object of uh, power and beauty. And I think that what Valerie has done in this particular exhibition, which of course I highly recommend everyone go see, is to really let the works of art speak to each, to each other and to really get into the art. And the way you've displayed the Judith Scott in the show, Valerie, she is with uh, so many artists of different eras, and she's very powerful, and it's a very powerful piece, and it stands on its own. Thank you. Glenn. Uh, more, more an observation, I guess, than a question, was that all of the artists that we have been discussing are sort of north of the equator. So I'm wondering, uh, outsider art as a category, as a sort of body of art historical knowledge, does that go below the equator? Or <laughs> yes, there's really rich traditions in Australia, South America, Brazil, Colombia, um, that I'm aware of personally. I'm sure Valerie knows more than I do. But are they conceptualized in the same way as that we're talking about here? In Australia they are, but that's, even though it's south of the equator, it's, it's a more westernized European kind of tradition, although the aboriginal work there is um, kind of parallel with it in some ways, and they're, they're having interesting conversations about how they're the same and different <coughs> artists with disabilities there in aboriginal work, and they're trying to see if it mixes or doesn't mix, and um, how, uh, what it means for them as a you know, colonial culture, too, to uh, look at those two things together. The work that I've done in South America, in Brazil, and Colombia with um, uh, people with disabilities and often disenfranch disenfranchised um, communities that are introduced in art making resonate with me in some ways in terms of what happens north of the equator in terms of the questions that come up and the, the issues and the discussions we're having. Um, this phenomenal work happening in Colombia with children and young adults from um, orphaned through drug cartels or who were sex workers and they're introducing art making as a, as a model to uh, sort of realign them in society and, and the work is astonishing and its impact on the people is um, uh, pretty interesting. And that might be really culturally specific in terms of the power that that's having, but um, it's really, it raises a lot of the questions that we're talking about. I think a good question, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm really fascinated by, or the questions that are being asked around uh, biography and narrative. Um, and I'm just wondering in, 
I don't want to say in your field or like in this classification, but I'm just wondering if there's a tension or an unspoken tension with this moment of the information age and how um, your organizations or in your curatorial practice, how you, um, how you work against this kind of like fast paced sort of um, instant categorization or, you know, speaking about the, the catalog and how you want people to just view the images, the way that we view images in this time is very particular. Um, the questions are already asked before the people really even enter spaces. I just wonder, is there, is it seen as a tension? Is there, is it seen as an anxiety or how do you feel in your work that you're working to mediate that situation, if that makes sense? The thing that bothers me the most about it is actually not when it's, um, mediated that way is the experience of having, um, I think the reason why I always react so quickly to biography is if we're showing creative growth artists, whatever, in a group show, in a gallery, in an art fair, whatever, and you know, people walk right and say, what's wrong with her? And what's wrong with him? And what's wrong with her? And what's wrong with her? And they're not even looking at the work. And, and you know, there's so much of that in people that aren't even taking the time to look at um, any kind of context or do the first pass. I'm a, of course, biography is hugely important. So I respond to that kind of um, um, immediacy. And I, I think actually being able to pull up information um, through the internet or through different sources is actually helpful because you get access to more information. And if you're all interested in what's happening, you'll look at it and you'll get a, a more balanced um, response. Yes, the downside of that is also that everybody's an expert today. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the problem is also in other field in journalism, it's like everybody can be the, a journalist today. I think it's, it's the um, uh, superficiality of the information you can get on some of these artists and it's, it's already, uh, it, it's, it's I think mostly one of the more, um, the most important problems and I think I encourage people to go back to read the, the old essays that have been written uh, a long time ago and, and, and also uh, read the, the first and sources and uh, the writing, uh, the writings by the artists themselves that are uh, essential sources and are often not, often not uh, saved and conserved. So when they are accessible, I think they are the most important documents to, to read at first and to avoid this um, mass of information accessible on the internet that are uh, incorrect. And you know, I'll also probably get four or five emails a week from, I am an outsider artist, here is my website, please represent <laughs> me. You know, so it's really, it's mixed on both, both sides, both from the maker and from the viewer and from people that are organizing the work as well. But one thing that's been neglected in the conversation is that there are people who are not mentally ill or disabled who are perfectly sane but didn't go to undergrad or grad school but we have the internet, we have, like I mentioned earlier, we have Tumblr and the YouTubes and we have people who have Etsy accounts and more and more, this is the budding conversation, it's even been, you know, everyone's talking about it, is that more people have this foul taste to them out to the blue chip gallery world, they won't have anything to do with the museum institution. More artists are striving for autonomy and are incorporating themselves and making $75,000 pieces and making $80 pieces on Etsy. And that's kind of, it's this new, there is a new paradigm that the internet has created where people are taking a, and they're becoming famous, and they have they're basically their own autonomous gallery, and they're written about in art in America. Brad Trammell, I think that's his name. Well, I think it was limited, maybe the emphasis is because that's what we were here to talk about. Uh-uh, we're talking about outside art. No. And that's what outside art is. Thomas, would you like to read the title of the program? No. <laughs> uh, we had one more question, and then I think... Uh, how many others were there? Because I've been given the signal. Someone else, please. Okay, I'll try to make this fast. Um, I was at a talk recently at the kitchen on audience and uh, how Foster positioned that a lot of like collaborative, contemporary, participatory sort of projects that used to be considered. Uh, on the outside of contemporary art practices and they weren't part of the full echelon, they were sort of on the periphery, have now become completely at the center. And he used the example of outsider art to sort of attest that this sort of renewed interest and vigor in outsider art practice is really in sort of 
I guess, uh, response to the collaborative sort of participatory works that have become so predominant. And I, I think he meant this, and I know I'm paraphrasing what he's saying, so uh, not to do him a disservice. I think he meant this in a, a good way of considering like the importance of the object and the powers that can hold and bestow. But I wonder, in this constant sort of binary positioning that the art world always seems to be very occupied um, in placing, which is part of, I guess, the Western canon, um, I wondered if that's actually just further fetishizing the outsider practices in some ways, and how you respond to that. Is it unclear? I think that um, without uh, answering directly to, uh, to your question, I think that um, the comments that we are, uh, the critics or the, the comments that we are hearing a lot at the moment, like when, for instance, um, professional artists are including works, um, outsider artists, or the works by self that are inside their own presentation, their own displays. I think that it, it creates really like uh, discomfort, debates, and uh, how these works are finally cannibalized by the contemporary art world. It's the critics I heard sometimes uh, about uh, discomfort between uh, the inclusion of those artists on the platforms of the contemporary art world. I mean, it makes me think about um Actually, Thelma Golden's introductory statement to the catalog for this show, where she said that institutions, and I would say the related disciplines, right, which then inform them, have to do the work, the dirty work, which means to categorize, define, which in that work oftentimes means delimit, structure. <laughs> and what happens is, is that then if, if things are really working the way they should, then the artists are constantly throwing it back at us, right? And constantly pushing bounds and challenging what those definitions and therefore sometimes perceived as limitations are. So it's a little bit of a pas de deux in a way, where you're kind of dancing and, and things shift and that's a good thing. And, and I think a great example is that you had that conversation with Hal Foster at the kitchen. Perfect. It's like really points to the role that performance has taken within a museum or a certain kind of institutional structure. It's shifted considerably in the last 10 years. And so here we have another. And these, and, and we'll continue to do this as if, if, if we continue to do our jobs. Um, and I think it's an exciting thing. And, and I don't know if that answers your question at all, but these are just reflections. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for bringing the artists that you brought to this conversation. I'm bowled over by William. Um, and he is kind of like, exactly the thing about the visionary that I opened up with is that the visionary is actually utopian entirely. And the thing about the utopian is that it's perceived to always be somehow irrational or illogical. But it's a beauty. It's a, it's an irrationality that we should all really. Want. So well, he's a beautiful guy, and if you come out to Oakland, you should come and visit him. We'd love to. We'd love to meet you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.